Hi everyone, Ben and I are super excited because we have guests joining us today in V and Noah. Welcome gents. Industry heavyweights, Gabe. Welcome as our first guest, gents. I'm, I'm super excited about this and I've just got a caveat with the last episode. I think I said pumped about eight times in the first 24 seconds, but yeah. uh, this one I really am pumped for. What drew you to uh, join us on the podcast, Noah? There is so much happening in the industry. I would say that there are two people on LinkedIn with a tornado icon next to their name. So that's really what drove me initially. Love seeing what you guys have been doing for the past few years and was very keen to jump on this when I saw that you have a photo. For me, it's the same. The energy that you guys are, are sending to the market, the excitement, the enthusiasm. For the last five or six years, I was really around cyber platforms, cyber technologies. And I think in the last year, it changed for me. My passion is around people. So seeing how you guys interact with the industry and coming up with a podcast to help people understand better, I got pumped. I see what you did there. Yeah. Hey, just quickly for me, and, and I'm keen to get straight into rabbit holes. So you mentioned the people-centric nature. I'm keen to explore that a little bit. I know that you both are very passionate about the empathetic and human element to cybersecurity. And I mean, you've got a really interesting background that perhaps had the ability to lead you down another path. Both these gents have an Israeli background, so you can see where the rabbit holes are going to unfold right from the word go. But are you able just to give us an indication on where you started, how you got into cybersecurity and, and the why? So look, I've always been close to security or information security, and then it became cybersecurity by being part of operations of technology uh, vendors. And I'm talking now about uh, my time in Australia since 18 years ago all the time working with technology vendors, transforming applications or transforming networks. And always there is that element of security, whether people talk about it formally or, or not, but it's there. And then I think it was when I was working at Akamai, which is a large platform that helps to drive business and communication over the internet faster, better, and secure, that I realized how fast the people around the world are getting connected and how fast people are becoming reliant on technology and internet connection. And whenever there is an opportunity, there is a risk, right? So as soon as people started to adopt services online and over the internet, as soon as people in different places of the world were able to communicate, you could see uh, problems starting or the risk increasing. And this is where I started paying attention more and more around cybersecurity. I was fortunate enough that to have a group of uh, friends still in uh, Israel, some of them uh, are now overseas, but that transitioned their career in the IDF from typical Navy or typical Air Force and or typical intelligence into cyber-related domains within those parts of the military. Because every military in the world, every type of armed forces is adopting cyber and cyber is becoming part of every, every part of the army, right? It, it's all becoming digitized. So speaking to those people, understanding what they're doing got me really excited. And then I think it was back then in 2016 when I came across a couple of friends of mine locally in Australia who both had some interesting backgrounds. They really came from some special units, special intelligence units, I also work with the local AGO. And we said to ourselves, what? How about we leverage our contacts, our experience, and use the fact that we are welcomed here in Australia. It's a great place. Let's see how we can help. So we came up with the concept of localizing technologies, commercialized technologies approved by the Ministry of Defense in Israel to be distributed to the five eyes and to Western countries. So very quickly, by the time, I think it was 2016, 2017, ISIS were in the news. The Western country, especially in Western Europe, were all about how do we combat this trend? How do we go about this risk that is rising and, and using a lot of those dark web that the traditional law enforcement people were not used to? They were not used to deal with it. Fast forward, we were able to curate uh, a set of advanced and more important commercialized platforms and techniques and started speaking to the different local state police, the local law enforcement authorities. And very quickly, we got a good audience. 
And I wasn't surprised. I wasn't surprised that the appetite was there and that those agencies and organizations had really great talent. Like we were fronting many meetings and presentations about those topics with really good questions and in-depth understanding. But luckily for us, Australia was not suffering from the pain of the lone wolves as Western Europe. And I think rightfully at the time, there was no high appetite or big appetite to invest a lot in that area. Although there were some interesting things happening, which I'm disclosed. But for us, after going through, it was two years of intimately pushing, promoting offensive cybersecurity platforms, such as cyber intelligence, being able to basically scrape gigabytes and gigabytes of data from social networks through public listed website without even gaining some intimate privileges like with the Cambridge Analyta saga that Facebook had. Just by looking at public, those AI-based algorithms were able to build profiles and, and give risk scores of different people. And on the other side, truly offensive technologies I won't say the name, but very similar to what people probably heard recently. And so a full-blown offensive Trojan-based intercept, cyber interception platform. We actually realized that it's really exciting. You can spend hours understanding and the, the geniosity and the innovation around it. But the market actually sits with the enterprise, with the companies, because unfortunately, the adversaries... And all the cyber criminals and all the scammers, they have it under their hands. They can just get their own tools. Yes, there might need, not be the state of the art, but it's very easy to, and we're not going to talk about it in this podcast. This is not how to hack, but it was very easy for them to just do a big scam and, and take money from companies. So we saw the opportunity in helping customers defend. And it's even more than that. And I think that's why I made that transition. As I told you, when we were promoting offensive platforms, the audience, the people we were talking to, they were quite educated, right? L like the people in the law enforcement uh, agencies across the country are very professional. But when we moved to the corporate side, customer land, we saw a gap in understanding. We saw a gap in education. And I don't know, I, I get pumped whenever there is an opportunity to teach or to educate because you get more satisfaction than just delivering on a project or fulfilling a, a requirement. Being in a position to teach or to educate is something for me that I found quite satisfying. Changing that shift from pushing offensive thinking, offensive working with people, that's their job in life, to actually work with almost everyone because everyone today find themselves at a the risk there's so much there you've triggered my brain about 12 times in that four minutes Avi. so appreciate that one thing i did want to ask is transitioning from that offensive mindset into people centric and that education base was that a difficult transition from my own background transitioning from a kinetic base and an offensive based mindset into strategic people centric and, and education mindset was it took a long time to transition because in the back of your mind, you're consistently thinking about the offensive ramifications of what you're uh, educating people on. Yeah, I think the transition is still happening. I, I can't say I'm 100% transition because I think one of the things that helped me with what I'm doing is still having that offensive mindset or still staying in touch with those group of people because it's a great way to learn what the other side might or is doing. I think what's helping me is when you are coming from an offensive mindset and you're moving into a more consultative mindset around helping people uh, transform and mature, very quickly, I think what helped me was to realize and also hear about some, hear from industry leaders about fear is not a, an education tactic. Don't use fear to explain. Don't use fear to teach. I, I, I started basically realizing that I need to use less technical buzzwords and less technical words and less uh, military-oriented or operational-oriented opera words and, let, and make them more, more I would say, corporate-like, more soft. More relatable. Yeah, and trying to use a lot of business-related context. 
I don't think I'm fully transitioned. And I think that it's actually a good thing because being able to, to have that, and I usually have this uh, mask with me to show, but I decided not to bring it now. <laughs> Having the ability to put that mask sometimes for a couple of minutes helps to get things more in context and sometimes also introduce, I would say, a different approach or a different angle to a conversation that is going on. Gabe and I both laughed at something you mentioned earlier, which was um, fear-based learning. And we identified that within our first three, four weeks in first role together. The industry's done a great job of fear-mongering to the point where it's become that psychosocial element to cybersecurity. That's been driven by the fear-mongering that was done in the early days of the fifth domain, which is, is cyber. We, we can potentially thank the fear-mongering based education for where we are currently as 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 people within the, the industry to, to re-educate that it is okay and there is a human element to cybersecurity as well. Gabe, I saw you had a good laugh at that as well. Yeah, time to change for sure. But I love the mindset around understanding the offensive capabilities in cybersecurity to be a great defender. And I would say it's interesting to hear your perspective, Avi, because what I have seen and learned coming out of Israeli Defence Force tech startups is the best defenders are the best attackers. So if you can understand that adversarial nature, either side, you can be better. So it's a great mindset to have. It also rings true, Gabe, and just made me think of that analogy we heard a long time ago that defenders have got to be right every day of the week, whereas yeah. the attackers only got to be right once. Once, uh, exactly. For success. This rings true. Yeah. It's an interesting uh, point you raised. I have a colleague, he's a professor in one of the universities, and he actually came up with uh, his own, I would say, profiling questionnaire that allows him to, again, it's all stats based, but it gives an indication to a student or individual about their uh, personality. Will they be better in cyber as an offensive player? Mm -hmm or mm -hmm. as a defensive, and, and there is a difference. So I'm not sure, I'm not convinced from seeing things in the industry and also speaking to him that someone who, and I'm fortunate because I'm not an offensive hacker and, and at the same time, I'm not running a SOC. I advise on those aspects, but I'm not sure that a great red teamer, right? Could be uh, a, a very good uh, SOC analyst. And that takes me also because, look, for us, we've been in the armed forces. So I'll take it back to where I grew, which was the Navy. And I'll look at, for example, the Israeli Navy SEALs, which I think it's very much to all the, the divers everywhere. Diving is a very risky profession. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm seeing Gabe smiling. You need to know what you're doing. And there are procedures and processes. like, And, and, and you can't just be innovative, right? Under the water, right? There is, yeah, and I, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not a Navy SEAL. I wasn't a diver, but you need to know how to go into deep, how to come back. And it needs to be well-planned. So you can't just take someone with a loose cannon like Noam, right? And <laughs> I float on them. On a diving mission. So the same with, when you work in a, there are playbooks, there are processes that you need to follow. And sometimes those processes are written with a lot of, I'm saying sometimes, because in some cases I've seen people copy pasting with no much making sense, but those processes should have in place thought prevention activities. And if you bring someone with a loose gun, creative, smart, he might miss some basic step, which would have contained the breach. Yeah. Which, which is where we're going. And we talked about this only yesterday is fusion centers and the yeah. power of fusion centers to create that predictive and proactive approach to all elements of the digital domain. Getting that cross-reference ability from the red team to the white team, to the blue team, to the purple team, all involved together to create successful outcomes. And, and you were talking the other day about how that's an American approach that has now been repopularized recently. I was going to say that interagency sharing, which is even between those different types of stakeholders, Ben, so totally. Noam, I feel like you've been quiet for too long. I'm keen to get your take on, on where we've headed in this conversation. My army career by being drafted to the one of the units, it's called Mamram, which is probably, we were 100 soldiers in the course, starting the course. I don't know the numbers, I would assume 80% of them are now after their third exit. 
after uh, building and selling uh, cyber security or other startups. Uh, I left after one month. I just I couldn't see myself working with computers. Uh, so I think even back then it was I need to be engaged with people. And I found myself in the Air Force Intelligence. And this is really where I got the appreciation to the power of information and translating information into actionable data. Um, it's something that suddenly in cybersecurity came back into play, understanding the importance of understanding what is out there, uh, understanding what you're trying to protect, what you're trying to defend, understanding what techniques the attacker might use, and based on that, to position yourself in order to maximize your opportunity to prevent the attack or to respond to the attack and so on and so forth. But my career was, I started my career uh, in the IT, in internet security, uh, internet service provider help desk. And I came to Australia 20 years ago to install a cardiology information system. And I had a very long career and enjoyable, and I like to think successful career in medical technologies and being part of this group of people that treat patients, right? Being able to deliver a piece of technology that enables the doctor and the nurses to save lives, right? I've sat in many um, cat labs and observing uh, operations on, on people and seeing people going into cardiac arrest and being revived on the table. And knowing that you are playing a very, very small part but you are delivering a technology that enable this to happen. This is really where I find my joy. So I progress and I have, I, I moved from technical support to advisor through many different roles, always different roles, but the core stay the same. It's about connecting with the people that are working with you, connecting with the people you want to help, and really focusing on the people. The technology is always there as an enabler. It's not the end goal. And working in IT companies, either as a vendor, at a vendor or working for a system integrator, I came across many people that they wake up in the morning and they go, okay, I can, I can make the most of my commission today. And this is where I go and I'm going to sell. And it's very transactional. It's very short-sighted in my belief. I believe that in every interaction, you try to add value. You try to educate. Uh, if a sale happened or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, and usually it happens. And usually it doesn't happen now. It happens a year later, two years later, uh, three years later. The amount of times that I have conversations with people that I've met five years ago, and now they come because now the opportunity presented itself to do something together every single day. And I'm very fortunate to, to be able to be in, a, in an industry that really you can bring yourself to it because, there is, because it's people driven. Every single person can add as long as you are authentic and real to yourself and, and try to do good and it happens in, in the long term. No, um, I want to pick a few things you mentioned there, which was mm -hmm. the power of information you realized early on. I'd like to offer up even to the audience to take a look at things like OSINT, Open Source Intelligence. It's a very good tool to have in the tool belt. And then you also mentioned technology as the enabler. So I'll zoom out here and throw you a question around megatrends, sure. which is what do you think of the term information overload? So when I started with cyber five years ago, I had a couple of tools that I was trying to sell and promote. It was about advanced concepts, right? One of them was micro-segmentation, which until today, they, it's still a bit more mature to where the market is. A yeah. bridge and attack simulation. And it was, hey, Mr. Customer, do you need to do bridge and attack simulation? Not the person on the other side. Don't even understand what, you know, who is this guy that suddenly pop up in his inbox? And uh, what are you talking about? And about uh, two, two years ago, I just, I told Avi, listen, uh, we can't, we were successful, right? We were selling uh, technologies, but I told him it, it doesn't feel right. 
we need something more because people, you can't keep on bombarding people with information about technology and hey, you need to have this. And, and Israel is great in the sense that they keep on developing uh, new stuff. I have yet to come across that is not a Gartner magic quadrant or a Forrester next wave or a cool vendor. All of them are, all of the three, all of them are the best things that ever happened to humanity. And they are going to solve all the problems that, that we have. I have to interrupt and just say one thing about Israel and the vendors over there is that the good thing about Israel is that everyone knows cybersecurity. The bad thing about it is that everyone think they know cybersecurity. <laughs> and, and, we, and I told that we need to, stay, we need to think about something else. It, it, we can't keep on throwing this. And I came across uh, the Sys controls framework. And the Sys control frameworks was what really enabled me to start and be able to be more in tune with what I was trying to do. Because uh, the Sys controls, to those that are not familiar with it, is in the current version, it's 18 best practices or 18 different domains that every single organization should think about, understand how they are related to the business, right? The context of their business, and they have basic hygiene. Things like know all the hardware that you have, know all the software that you have, a vulnerability management program, conduct a penetration testing, user awareness training, data encryption, and so on and so forth. But it's a tool that enables to have strategic conversation and not focus on the vendor. Um, and I found that every single organization that is using this control or a different fr framework, what it really enables is to have conversations and have both internal and external conversations around the security posture, which enable to put a plan in place to mature it over time and become resilient. Yeah, I, I do see that as the foundation because even for me personally coming into cybersecurity industry four years ago, I was like, wow, this is really saturated. It's heavily convoluted and it's very complicated. How can I do my best effort to oversimplify mm. this problem here? And I went straight to creating a diagram, which ended up actually being used by Cyber, but it's that ecosystem map around Sys controls framework, NIST, ACSC, Essential 8, and even things like MITRE ATT&CK and now DEFEND, which are those core frameworks to understanding better security postures, what we can build a strategy around and how we can mitigate those threats. So I'm a big fan of, of starting with frameworks. Yes. And, and I think that just to finish and jump into my mind is that five years ago, we were talking about how do you close the gap between the skill shortage and the increasing threats. And the approach that we took back then was using automation, mm -hmm. right? So focusing on automated technologies in order to close this gap. Today. Yeah, so the last five years proved yeah. that it's not the answer, yeah. right? You can keep on throwing automation. At the end, you need somebody that can either manage the automation or understand what the automation give you. So I truly believe that the answer to this gap is education and training, and you need to bring more people into the industry, either by upskilling existing IT, general IT professionals to give them cybersecurity education, or bringing a whole new group of people that has nothing to do with IT, but need to understand cybersecurity, you know, psychology. Uh, I, I read a very interesting article, not article, I went on a, a webinar and, and it was talking about the fact that Glassdoor, the website that you can review your employers. So there is a professor from the US, he took uh, the data, he looked at companies that had low rating on Glassdoor. He looked at companies that had high rating he then looked and he found public uh, known data breaches that happened to these companies. 
and there is a correlation between the lower the rating of the employer, the higher the chance to the company being breached. And the reason is because the people don't care. So it doesn't matter if they have good technology. Make sure that your people are happy. Make sure that they are thinking about the company. Then they'll want to secure it and they won't click the link. It comes back to what we talked about earlier, which is that people-centric approach. It doesn't matter whether that's business-related or cybersecurity-related. They're all intertwined to create the same outcome. And I love that you brought that up. You mentioned so much in there, Noam, that I really want to go back to. But in the interest of time, and we could go for four or five hours here, but Mam Ram, I just want to give you a big shout to that because that's incredibly cool as a heritage, regardless of how long you spent there. But one thing you said was the importance of data and Gabe touched on it too, but something that came to my mind that I attended a, a session recently at Ace of Brisec and David Fairman was talking to, to fusion centers and how the importance of data in order to create an intelligence-led uh, data decision-making process. And that's the importance of, of how we can achieve that. And to tie back to what you just touched on at the end is that skills gap and how we breach. I, I think you're absolutely right. We need to have that education to get to the point of an intelligence-led data-driven decision-making process. But that's right for now. It, my forecast is in the next 10 years through education now, we will have far better technologies to be able to drive the outcome that we're looking to achieve now. I just think we were too eager to get the autonomous word in front of all that of the technologies that it wasn't and it comes back to human inherent trust we didn't have the the inherent trust in the technologies to take those decisions on our behalf at the time but through education over the next five ten years i think we will get there where we'll have the ability to have that trust in the technologies to make decisions on our behalf nothing like a gartner magic quadrant either ben but the old gartner hype cycle where yeah. automation exploded so everyone was like let's get ai ml but that's also still developing so yeah. Automation is even still maturing. Yeah. I take it when I look at things, you, you would never go into a physical store, like a shopping center today, thinking that it's not a safe place. Nobody can open a store, physical store, without getting electrician approval, getting the fire brigade saying that it's safe. You walk into the environment, you feel safe, you know that those are CCTV cameras. If somebody is going to steal something for you, it'll be catch and so on and so forth. We don't have it in the online world. And people can go now, register a domain, open a business, and operate without any need to get any sort of security certification. And I think this is something that will have to change in the next few years because, and that's the much, we are focused on the enterprise, right? The enterprise, the commercial world is focused on the enterprise because that's where is the money. The reality is in Australia, all the small businesses, family-owned businesses, good people, great ideas. They just want to make a living. They go and they say, okay, I'll do something online. They've never been educated Maybe about it. Them. How about you share with them the, how we helped yesterday, a small business. We, we got a call and we just helped them. So it's a small business, started the one website. Then they had another idea. They, started, they ended up, they have three websites three different sets of uh, email. They didn't know that you can enable MFA on your emails. The, as a result, they had a business email compromise. The client paid a hefty six figures into a different account. Wow. Uh, hopefully they'll get out of it, but they bought the product, wanted to on sell it. Now they didn't get the money. They need to pay to their supplier. It's a whole mess. And they didn't know. And I, I know that there is already technologies happening around being able to identify that the website that you are logging into is the website that you think that you're logging into. So authentication, not of the user, but authentication of the website. You want to know that when you type whatever address, this is really the, the website that you get. That was product placement there, Noam. I don't know if you saw that. Ah, I didn't see yeah, it. <laughs> I, I, I say that is, uh, that is our responsibility as an industry, that we haven't done the, the right, we haven't laid the right foundations for small businesses and consumer-based understanding of cybersecurity uh, and the foundational elements to achieve a level of secure. 
I think you're, you're, you're spot on. And I think that there are a lot of businesses out there that are serving small businesses. And I think as an industry, but also regulators as an, 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 and as a country, we need to say, listen, if you are after the small to medium enterprise market, if you are after those ones, and I'm using now a theme taken from the e-safety website, which I'm also following all the time, and they talk about safety by design. So if you are going to offer B2B solutions, if you're going now to offer email or payments, or you need to show or prove to the regulators that you are secured. And it's not just transferring the ownership to those poor moms and dads businesses, because at the end, they are the biggest victims. Yes, we always hear about those big enterprises, and but I think... It is more catastrophic for a small business to go through a cyber uh, breach or, or a cyber attack than it is to a large enterprise. I had a few people reach out to me in the last couple of years. They were providing services around business continuity, connectivity to small businesses. And the sentiment back to me was, they're now coming to me and asking me to help secure their environment. Where do I start? How do I do this? And absolutely, that material impact to SMBs is far more pronounced than what it is in the enterprise because it could be a $100,000 a year business. And if they get ransomed for $400,000, that's a 4x demand on what their earnings are. So it's catastrophic to those type of the small businesses. But there's no elasticity built into a small, medium business. The enterprise, as you touched on, Arby, they have the ability to pull back, pull from and present out whether that's cash flow to, to pay off ransom or to bring in the incident responders to do the response. Those small, medium businesses, that, that, that affects them drastically to the point where it's easier just to close shop. And then we talk into the psychosocial element of that affecting family, affecting customers, affecting the blast radius there is significant. And, and just touching on what you mentioned before, Ben, about intelligence-led cybersecurity, right? Yes, I, I totally agree. And I can see it happening. And you can look at the Corey framework by APRA with the financial services and how intelligence-led testing is happening. But then we can have a conversation about that. And then we, we think about the small businesses. There is no way that these guys will ever, right, in, in the near, short-term, medium-term, even long-term, in a small business, start thinking about, okay, how do I get intelligence? I, I think intelligence-led security needs also to go and become baked or built in with those services uh, that are being offered to run those businesses. And yeah, there are lots of ideas there, but I That's think- a great perspective, Arby, for sure. So what do you offer up as advice to those SMBs? I will keep it simple. I always- like to keep it simple. Sometimes I can talk forever and then it sounds complex, <laughs> but I think in security, let's just keep it simple. And first of all, let me just share something. The best way to protect an IT system is by shutting it down and then taking the parts off. Even if you shut down a computer, let me tell you a secret and I'm not going to say more, but even if it's off, it doesn't mean that there's nothing nasty happening, but we can have an offline session and we can talk about it. And See, Avi, I'm glad that you and Ben are on that side and Noam and I are on this side because that was such a great gem that I actually learned from Ben. He's like, if anything, turn it off, unplug the cables, leave it there overnight. I'm like, why don't we say that on loop and post it somewhere? <laughs> so if you're a small business, right, let's start and understand first where is your data that is important to you? Where is the data that you need to keep safe and secured because of regulation? And what are your key business process, right? If you are buying and selling, or if you're a lawyer, you're providing advice, what are those key business processes that are reliant? On? Very quickly, you come, and I'm doing it with lots of clients, you come to a realization that with a small business, it's half a page. That's it. We wrote down your crown jewels and crown jewel processes. And now the plan is around securing them and putting some processes. And you very quickly see that, and especially if we had a bit of intelligence based on what's most threatening, right? You, you see that at the end of the day, protecting it and ensuring its hygiene, it's not a very costly exercise, right? And, and I've seen people saying, hang on a minute, why do I need this? Why do I keep it here and here? 
Why do I? And they can, because they are small businesses, right? Not like the big banks. They can't just get rid of systems like that. These businesses can transform quite quickly. Love that approach, Avi. Do you, and just to kind of get Norm's offering up on, on as well, but just quickly, from my side, that there's a lot of organizations that are federally driven that could assist with this. And even just to what you talk to, I'm thinking cyber.gov.au or the ACSC could have tracks enabling small to medium businesses to have that foundation to be safe by design and to understand that because it's, we're not actively managing the change for people, technology and process at the moment at SMB to consumer level. If you can put a link or I'll put a link when you post on LinkedIn to cyber.org.au, I'll start with slash MFA. Mm. I just get people to understand what MFA is. They have great, this is what I've done yesterday when this, um, when I got in touch with, with actually somebody that uh, used to be my manager and her brother had an issue. And that's where we started educating. Uh, I didn't need, need to do anything but to tell them, have a look at cyber.gov.au slash MFA, understand what MFA is, enable it on your email as a way to moving forward at least. And making yeah, sure. nice. Um, it's amazing how much of the population doesn't do that. And even to see it come out in one of the ACSC advisories in the last year, I was like, wow. Yeah. Very surprising. It puts perspective on it and it hurts us as an industry because we're not doing enough. Yeah. Uh, but then I must say that uh, I came across, you come across uh, situations working with bigger organizations that you really cannot believe that's the case and how they operate because they've been dragged by a vendor in a certain area or certain position. Um, I'll give you one example. A customer that we've, uh, Avi and I have been working with and firewalls and let's put a DLP and everything. And we told them, hold on one second. Let's do what Avi said. Let's understand where your data is and what IT system and operations you have. And after half an hour of conversation, it came up that once a month, they take all of the customer database and they send it using FTP, not encrypted, not secured, to a marketing company. So the marketing company can run the campaigns. Yeah, I, I took four Nurofen after that. And that's not... <laughs> four I boxes of Nurofen. Pull off his chair as well. Yeah. So, so it's, a, it's the lack of maturity. I, I think I understand where it's coming from. Australia is the best place on this planet. Life is good. You don't need to, you don't have the mindset or the DNA that you develop living in an area of conflict, right? That you need to be worried that you don't know what's going to happen next, that it's content, constantly, uh, you need to be on guard. That's why I'm in Australia. That's why I love Australia, but that's the downside. People are so relaxed here, so secured. It won't happen to me and we need to help them. We need to help change it along the way. Do you think that impacts negatively too? Conversely, just to throw the, the, the converse to that topic there is that as Australians, because we haven't experienced conflict to the degree of some other nations, we have an inherent trust and, and that extends you know, far beyond just human interaction. It extends to technology. It extends to everything within life. And the reason I ask, this is the first year uh, that my daughter has asked about some of the deployments I took overseas in, in you know, war zones and operations that I conducted over there. And she her questions to me were around the children and how they live life. And, and my you know, comments back to her were that they picture your life and how comfortable you are just to walk out your front door, go play in the front yard, go play in the backyard, go to the shops with mum and dad and, and whatever have you. That isn't considered let alone allowed in some of those war-torn countries because they've got a generation of understanding war and, and conflict and having that, I'm going to throw out a, a zero trust here, but having that zero trust mindset to life. So, so I can tell you, right, that I don't know when it was, 13 years ago or whenever, after I became a citizen and I went to vote for the first time and I went into the vote. First of all, I had a few of them to choose from in the neighbourhood. Right in Israel, you are we are being told this is the place you're going to vote. Uh, you have only one place you can vote. You need to bring your ID. 
and they check your ID and they actually, I, I think from memory, they stamp either your ID or something. You can only vote once, right? Once and in one place. In Australia, where you can choose where you want to vote and you go in and there is a very nice lady that asks you, have you voted today already? And that's the process of verification, right? Uh, trust. And I actually, I voted, I left and I went back in and I thought, excuse me, what prevents me now from going somewhere else and voting again? So she looked at me in an amazement and she said, but I've already asked you if you voted today. And that's the core of Australia. And that's why I love Australia. We still have this trust. There is still honesty, right? You don't have it in other places. And I hope we would never lose it here. But I want to add an optimism view, because that's why, by the way, I came to Australia just for a year or two, and now it's 18 year, years that we are here and <laughs> no plans of going Not back. Not leaving. With everything that is going really great here and people are sometimes a bit laid back and, and the trust and all the good things, also, uh, Australia was a role model to Israel, and this is something people don't know around the, we call it in Israel, the war in the, in the roads. So fighting accidents and, and the toll on the roads in Israel. There were a couple of articles I read a few years ago. Israel adopted a couple of well-implemented strategies and tactics that Australia did and followed. And, and it was very successful. So Australia was able to combat, obviously you want zero death toll, right? But Australia was is an excellence in, in, in that area. And another, I would say, domain which is similar is the occupational health and safety. Australia is very, is a leader, right? And well uh, developed in its regulatory compliance processes, procedures, and the discipline. Like you can't just go in, when I work with operation OT manufacturers or refineries, like you, you don't just go in, right? In Israel, you don't just go in because of security, and but you don't just go in because of safety. And Australia has a very mature approach to safety in the workplace. And I think if we look at or try, I've never done it, but if we look and try to understand why are we so advanced there? Why are we so successful? And what made it so successful? Maybe we can take some insights and then implement it in this industry. But one point that we need to realize that it's not going to be the same because different to when you look at safety, you don't have adversaries going in places and spilling oils and waiting for people to trip, right? In cyber, unfortunately, you have monetary motivated adversaries that are doing so. But if we take the foundation of what made the health and safety uh, domain in Australia and try to apply it also on cyber, maybe we can make some change. What an analogy. How do yeah. we do this? Can we just roll into Fed government or something or online? I heard that there is election coming in two weeks. <laughs> we should run you for a prime minister. Fine, I'll do it. Only once. Uh, no, um, yeah, we'll get you to once. vote multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> I, I always say that, you know, one, one day we'll wake up here with an Israeli prime minister you'll know that the Israelis went and voted more than once. I've never even considered that. And I'm really appreciative you brought that up because we do have a really great OHS and workplace health and safety, OHS, WHS practice in Australia. Why can't we Im impact that same methodology into cybersecurity and bring the two closer together? Do, do you see why there's a, a, at the moment, to me, it, it makes sense for them to be working hand in hand because health and safety of our staff, mental health, all the things that we talked to in the last episode um, of the impacts of cybersecurity could then be educated through the same programs at organisations through these. Because we all understand we go into a place, we get a workplace health and safety briefing or we do annual workplace health and safety and then we do the cybersecurity piece as well. Why aren't they integrated? Do you have thoughts on why they aren't integrated currently and is there, a, is there something I'm missing as to why it could be so easy? My, my personal view is that it's the fear from the unknown. So cyber comes across as very complicated. People just shy away and, and that creates a vacuum, right? That's create a, a hole. And into that hole, you get the vendors that are coming in. Because when you look at it, what shapes the, the theme or, or the messaging, right? Up until I think 
the government woke up and started pumping money into the regulators, to the ACSC, it, it was the vendors. Right, the vendors, they were shaping the narrative, they were funding the articles, they were so the more so I think it's just that lack of confidence of lack of understanding that cyber, yes, it could be very complicated if you choose to go down the bits and bytes and down to technical, but in terms of mitigating risk, because cyber at the end is a business risk, right? So if if you go on and, and look at it from that perspective. I think it's. Uh, I, I think it will be easier, but I think the change is coming by the moving of the focus to the boards and the executive management. Boards couldn't care less about what, what vendor you use, right? They, they don't know the names. They couldn't care less. They want to know that you're protecting their business. There is definitely more and more people operating in this space. But from what I see so far, it still have a technical flavor to it. It's uh, okay, we we will work with the board on behalf of the CISO, for example. And we'll put, let's educate the board about what does it mean to have security controls. I don't think that's the right approach, right? The right approach is think business. And like you say, think OHNS, create, for example, a subcommittee for cybersecurity and start and drive that from the top. Uh, and again, going back to people and culture, the difference of having a meeting, company meeting, being opened by a one minute cyber related uh, piece of information, such as please make sure that you change your password next week, something like that will have much more impact than buying another piece of technology. But I think it's coming, Ben. I think it's coming. I think that it's everything is getting to... You won't have the separation of cyber and business. It's one and the same. I just read this morning that in the US, there is a proposal by the SEC around public companies would have to show what risk management processes they have in place. So people would know if they should invest in this company. If a company is not willing to do the right things to protect itself, then they are not worth the shareholder money. So I think it's coming. Um, Yeah, You you raised something interesting there, Noman, and I'll share this on LinkedIn after the show's released, but a a great video from a friend of mine who has a satirical spin to it, but it's about... The, the annual uh, pen test report that's presented to an organization and the humor you can put alongside it. We talk about risk management and I agree that change is coming. I think we need to have clear definition on what risk management is uh, and how it is there is risk acceptance in, impeding a risk management platform. It's too easy at the moment to just put things that aren't patched, for instance, or things that aren't done and just put risk accepted. So therefore it is then accepted under the risk management plan which then could be broadcasted to consumers as the risk management is in place. However, backdoor to that, there is 57 gaping holes that are risk accepted because at the time it would have impacted the general network to have them patched. So that's my concern for for that, but I absolutely think that's where we're headed for sure. Do you see that currently, Avi, in, in your consultative approach where risk has been accepted in the wrong places? All the time, unfortunately. And again, it's because of lack of understanding, lack of also understanding what questions to ask. So if if we take, for example, board members, which is an area that I'm constantly developing my skills and talking to them and finding, finding, I would say, new ways of getting them to understand what I think most of us get is while they understand risk in general, they, they don't understand specifically the cyber risk or for them sometimes cyber is part of IT. It still is, right? And the biggest problem for them, border in place in order to ask questions, in order to audit, in order to monitor. And in many cases, they don't know what to ask, right? It's not, they understand now, they know that they're liable. Most of the board members, if you ask me now, got a memo 
from uh, ASIC and from the regulatory organization that they signed up with, that boards are liable for cyber and so on and so forth. The first thing that they will do is they'll check that they have uh, director's insurance and that the company has cyber insurance, that then they will continue their work. And then when they'll sit in the meeting, some of them will just accept things or go with the flow because there will be apologies for saying, and I'm not generalizing and it's not all board members, but I've seen board meetings where you could see they didn't know what to ask, so better not to say anything or not to ask, and then things are being uh, accepted. So yes, but look, if you look at the, I think it was last week that the federal court came up with the verdict around RI's advice, and it's interesting, we read the, the court ruling. It shows how the court starts by talking about two clauses in the Corporation Acts that were breached. Nothing in the words is cyber or technical. It's talking about duty of care and duty of delivering financial services. So that will have an impact. Absolutely. It will. I think that case ended with 750000 to support the ACSC's contribution to what is now the, the RRI Vice Group's strategy. But what I found interesting in that, and, and Noam, you were the first to share that, that, that I read, so appreciative of that. But in there, it suggests that they had the right uh, conversations, building the framework, but they didn't deliver. And, and that's, again, that's boardroom buy-in to then push that to the organization for delivery. So if you haven't got executive buy-in at board level or even C-suite, that responsibility still sits at that level to then impact that change more broadly in the organization. And that didn't happen. And, and I think that is a, a supreme failure of where, where that, how that case ended up. And I just hope that they, nobody thinks that it's the fault of the IT guys. And, and I really, I have so much respect and appreciation to the people that really need to do the work. I, I, have it, I have it very easy. I come in, I have a conversation, I try to help, I go home, I have no responsibility of the security. I cannot imagine what it's like to be a CISO, right? Having the responsibility, going to sleep, probably hoping that they are not waking up in the, during the night because something happened and not having the right support from the organization. It's just, oh, we need to be secured. Yeah, go and secure us, Mr. IT, Mr. SISO. Uh, and this is really where I think that things will have to change. They are changing, but yeah, we, we need to separate cyber and IT, right? It, it's all about business risk. It's all about uh, enabling the business to do what the business wants to do. And, and for that, you need, to, you need to support your people. You need to provide them with the right resources. In, uh, you can't expect the same person now to also do, you know, mo most of the mid-sized companies don't have cybersecurity teams. They have an IT team that now in the past few years have been tasked with also deliver cyber with the same budget, same amount of people. They can't. So I, I advise, I think that hopefully it will change things. But yeah, it's not the IT fault. I have conversations like this and plenty of ideas run through my mind. I'm inspired to launch an open source cybersecurity FAQ or Wikipedia. So let's also throw that in the, in the links. <laughs> Get everyone contributing. What are the best questions to ask at the board level? Even just as a starting point, that would be yeah. extremely helpful. So we could potentially co-author that together. Yeah, it, it brings me to the question, right? Because I listened to your previous session. As soon as it hit LinkedIn, I sat in and I listened to it. It was a pleasure, by the way. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> and, and you throw there, Ben, I think, Metaverse. You raised it. And I'm wondering, where do you think the four of us will be in three years' time, four years' time? Will there be avatars of us? On the Ethereum this? network. Yes. <laughs> Will it be avatars of us doing it? What, what is it real? Is it going to happen, this metaverse? And I saw last week, David Fairman, that you've mentioned. <laughs> Check my <laughs> NFT it's for NFT. those on the videos. <laughs> um, I have nothing left in the wallet after this week. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> bye bye, Tara. Look, I'm keen on Gabe's thoughts on that. Gabe and I rabbit hole the metaverse and where we'll end up in future too often to be honest but then the conversation changes every time we have it because of, of things that have changed before i hand over to gabe the, the supercomputer that the metaverse are building in, in order to define the the next evolution of ai in order to impact the metaverse for the betterment of and what their foundation is the betterment of 
human interaction with digital is phenomenal. It is the biggest thing you've seen since the toaster. Yes, I, I haven't seen it on soccer, which I know that is close to Gabe Hart. And by the way, uh, Gabe, Avi have no concept what soccer is. is so <laughs> I appreciate the tra- <laughs> struggles I have to go through. But, but there is a website, I think it's basketballverse.gg or something like that. And it's the con of having a basketball, think of basketball in reality and just move all of it into metaverse where people will have their character that they can play, but people can buy and build a basketball stadium and then have commercials to earn money in their court. They can hire it to other players that can come and play and buy time. It just, I look at my young son, I have a basketball hoop in the front yard. I wonder where he'll end up. Why will he he'll end up playing basketball for real? Oh. I will definitely come and play meta hoops with your son. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Gosh, where do you go with this conversation? This is like absolutely Pandora's box, but Ben must have been a real estate agent in his former life or something oh. because only just a couple of months ago, he was like, who's buying and selling digital land in the metaverse? Why don't we spin up a business around that? I was like, absolutely, let's go for it. But it, it, I think it was 400K, somebody bought the land next to Snoop Dogg. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was a recent. And there you go, information overload. Like, yeah. <laughs> because for people like us, we see it as, hey, it's an opportunity. We need to learn about it. We need to understand, are we missing something? Exactly, yeah. What's the word? Pseudonymity comes to mind for me. Kind of program my avatar. Oh, there we go. There's the syllables. Yeah. <laughs> or pseudo is replicating something that isn't real, but in right. as it relates to metaverse, could program my avatar to be a few different versions of myself. And I'm hanging out in this digital world, interacting with people, living my best life. Sounds like I could free up a lot of my real time. So wow. not a bad proposition. Oh, that opens so many boxes for me. As long as, long as your <laughs> different characters don't meet each other, that's the problem. You can have so many passive income streams through your autonomous avatar whilst exactly. you're earning a realistic... Yeah. Oh, there's so many opportunities there. If that ever happens, no, I'm just going to turn off computer, unplug cables. <laughs> Amazing. That's been great, guys. Thanks for joining us. I would like to wrap up there, but to finish up, I want to put you on the spot and ask you to tell us your best dark mode story. Avi, go first, because I need to, but, but define, dark, <laughs> define dark mode. But that's it's up to up you. It's open that's for interpretation. It. Yeah. This could be it. You never know. Hold on. It is being put on the spot. Need a good one. Rick, just to give you some juice to, to squeeze further, in the last episode, I shared that, you know, it's an enterprise question that I get every single time. Does the platform have dark mode? So, <laughs> so use that as inspiration. Something I don't know if I can if I should share it now, but it's definitely been a dark mode thing I've done. Somewhere in the 90s, I've done a full-blown phishing campaign against a lecturer in university in the US. I was my I was a second year student for a computer bachelor uh, degree in Israel in Tel Aviv. And I signed up for a computer graphics course because my brother who graduated a year before said, go and it's really exciting. You can develop lots of stuff. I went in, they just changed the lecture to, I think it was the mad scientist from Back to the Future. We just didn't understand the word. Anyhow, there was a, a final project and we had to build a f- complete flight simulator in OpenGL, in, in, in C+. It's like for what, after two and a half months? Anyhow, putting my offensive skills, I Google, Google existed at the time. I quickly Googled and I found that it was a project published on one of the universities in the US. I quickly set up an email on, it was the previous version of Outlook and disguised myself as a lecturer in one of the colleges in Israel and how great this project is. And the lecturer at that university was so excited and so on and so forth. And then at some point, would it be a bad idea that I get the source code? Oh, gosh. I don't know if that's fishing or catfishing. Definitely. I'm glad you're on the good side now. If you to watch this episode now. So <laughs> Thank you for sharing. That was a, yeah. That's I think the, the university is going to reach out after hearing this and, uh, and question your results on that one. Uh, go on, what about yourself? 
So, so a story that I can't tell too much about. So I'll have two one. One is the short one and the dark mode around being uh, able to debrief and brief a spy or whatever other words to use. So that was an experience, somebody that got to be involved in doing. And the other part is uh, being able to sit in dark rooms for many days and months and weeks of my life watching medical professionals doing what they do, um, it gives proportions to everything that we do. I, regard, I see myself very lucky to be able to observe all these people, you know, radiographers, for example, they sit not all their day in a dark room looking at images. One of the most profound experiences that I had was to, for one week, to shadow the head of radiation oncology at one of the public hospitals in Melbourne give you the appreciation to the fact that we can even have this type of conversation and to go and hug and, and, and kiss your loved ones. We need to remember at the end of the day, we need to do the right things. We need to support others, make the most of what we can do in our ability to, to make the world a better place. And I think that we, all of us on this call, we're doing it every single day and there is hope. My question, should we name dark mode bright mode? As a, but the better play on words, of course, as it relates to cybersecurity. So yeah. very profound, Noam. Thank you for sharing, Harvey, as well. Really appreciate your time. Insights Thank and perspectives you. have been great. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much. And I really look forward to episode 200 and us coming back again. Yeah, exactly. Every 02, you'll be on. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.